Promises are true in his strength. There is nothing we can do. Yes, we know there are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. Same power that rose Jesus from the grave. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Celeste Dvorak, and I am the chairperson for the missions team here. Um, most of you have heard me talk about missions before, and so I'm sorry if I'm repetitive, but I do know that there's some who are new here, and maybe you've just never been at the Springs during a missions month, and that's where we are. We are in missions month. February is our missions focus, and so that's what I want to talk about today. Um, we love missions. It's in our DNA. And God has blessed us with amazing missionaries. And so they're the ones I want to talk about today. This year, our theme, I think you, can, you saw it, is we will go. And we are going, aren't we, church? <laughs> We're going to go. <laughs> so um, it just seemed apropos for this month that our focus is called we will go. Um, and we desire above all, as we're going, to make God's steadfast love known. You can see our goal for the month, I mean, sorry, for our missions budget for the year is 115000 So where does this money go? Well, that's what I want to show you. I want to show you the beautiful missionaries that we support. And everything that we raise during this month, at the end of February, February 28th, um, all of it, that money on that day, whether it's cash or pledges, goes to this $115,000 budget. Um, and even quarters and nickels and dimes. 
<laughs> so kiddos, if you didn't pick up your um, change jars today during class, there should be some available outside um, at the welcome desk. So make sure you get these because even our quarters and our nickels and dimes um, from the children go towards this goal of 115,000. So on the following slides, I'll highlight those missionaries. This is where the money is going. First of all, you'll see Paul and Carol Brazel. Here are Paul and Carol. They, with their son Jesse, who's also still at home, um, are a rock. They are just a rock of steadfast, steadfastness in European missions. They've been in Belgium now for over 20 years, and the, the Springs has been blessed to be a part of that since the 1990s. Next, you will see Paul and Suzanne Whitmire. Paul and Suzanne have an amazing God story, and God has um, been so good to us at the Springs to allow us to be a part of the mission at Cross and Crown. And um, this year, you can see that this 2016 marks the 15th anniversary for Cross and Crown. Can you believe that? And some of us have been going and, and being a part of that since the very beginning of that. What an amazing blessing of steadfastness. Um, okay, so next we'll go back to Europe. This is Don and Cindy Rohrcassi. As you can, nope, mm -mm, go on. Oh, other way. There's the Whitmires. Okay, okay, there's Don and Cindy. Okay, um, another amazing example of God's work in Europe. And it's kind of dark there. Um, I don't know if you know what's going on in Europe right now, but the Rohrcassis are in the middle of it being a light. And thank God, because they have been there for over 20 years also. And we have been blessed to be a part of that for a long time now. These people are dedicated to reaching the lost in Hildesheim, Germany. So next we'll move on and highlight our rock team. Um, the Rwandan Outreach Community um, Partners are dedicated to reaching the people of, of Rwanda. And in Kigali, we have this beautiful team. We support three of the families on this team. And I'll show you their pictures next. So you can see Brian and Holly Hickson are next. Is it going? Okay, good. Um, Brian has been the executive director in Kigali and also the chairman of the board for KIX. Um, that's Kigali International Community School, so I'll just call it KIX. <laughs> Holly's primary duties have been uh, as a teacher of secondary sciences and worship ministry and many other things, and I think a lot of you know um, that I can probably pretty easily call her a prayer warrior of like the 10th degree. You know, if they were prayer ninjas, that's, <laughs> that's Holly. Um, she is amazing. And this family has been in Kial. Oh, where are they? They're so beautiful. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Um, they've been in Kigali since 2007. I can see them on mine. It's, they're cute. Okay, next one. Let's try them. Who's next? The Lindens. Do you see them? Oh, there they are. Okay, that one worked. Uh, this is Rusty and Onawa, and you see their beautiful three girls. They've been with the Rock team since 2010, um, which is just amazing to me. I can't believe they've been there that long already. Rusty serves as associate minister at um, Christ Church Rwanda, CCR. Um, he focuses on university ministries. And Onawa serves the Rwandan effort through her design skills and also through her body and soul ministry and, of course, many other things. I could list their primary duties, but they do so much. So moving on, let's look at the Shreks. There they are. Look at that beautiful family. Um, the Shreks, you can see all of their children that are with them there. They've been in Kigali also since 2010. Um, Brett is the senior minister at CCR, and um, Kelly does a lot of things through the children's ministry and so many other things. This, this, these are our three Rwandan outreach um, community partners that we work with. So moving on, we still are in Rwanda with this next beautiful lady. This is Jamie Boyles, and you can see what she does there. Jamie came to Rwanda with the Rock team in 2011, but she's now with Belay Global, um, still in Kigali doing wonderful work with women and uh, with setting people free. And um, God just most recently has done some amazing things through her work um, that include helping women in the sex trades to find hope and an alternate way to live and support their families. It's pretty awesome and amazing work. So those are our Kigali Rwandan missionaries. 
finally, I'd like to um, talk just a tiny bit about Predizon because I'm going to show you a video next about them. But you can see um, this is Juan, and God is doing amazing things in, pre in Honduras through Predizon. Did you know that this year is Predizon's 30th anniversary? 30 years. Praise God. <laughs> What an amazing work that's been going on for so long. It's a great milestone, and we've been involved since 1989, just almost since the very beginning of that. Um, people from the Springs, from Quail, have been going um, and sending support, so it's pretty, pretty awesome. Next, I'd like to show you that video, and then I'll come back and just wrap up. Thank you. Predizon vision is to see people in Honduras experience wholeness, physical, spiritual, social, economic, and environmental health. We do this by being Christ's hands and feet in partnership with community leaders, staff, donors, and volunteers, facilitating health services, education, and spiritual formation in ways that transform lives. Healthcare is the core part of our mission. We have developed over the years a complete healthcare system and we have the Good Samaritan Medical Center. We have diagnostic services, we have surgery, all the support services like pharmacy, lab. This is the best that you can find us in the community. Buenos días. Eh, mi nombre es Jose Braz. Yo soy médico ortopeda. Primero, la ortopedia es una necesidad muy importante para todo, todo, todo el rancho y todo el país. Y Predizan llega a lugares que pacientes tal vez no tienen las condiciones de, de llegar hasta acá por condiciones económicas, por condiciones de salud. I love here because eh, Predizan trabaja para el prójimo, no trabaja para Predizan. My dream is every person that comes to Predizan will see Jesus in our staff. We invest a lot in the spiritual development of our staff with disciples, with uh, devotionals, uh, Bible study. We have faith. Bueno, estamos en una de las zonas altas de Catacama, una de las montañas conocidas como La Esperanza, una comunidad que produce café, que produce mínimo. Y el propósito de estar acá es porque Predizan trabaja con, con voluntarios de salud, eh, trabajamos con los niños de las escuelas, los niños de la comunidad, y eso es importante para, para nosotros. A la vez hemos incorporado ya eh, durante casi tres años eh, la formación espiritual en nuestros voluntarios de salud. El Culmí es una otra municipalidad fuera de Caracama, and it has right now 18 health units. We have 16 health centers, and those are being run by an auxiliary nurse, and we provide basic health care, especially for mother and children. Vida Mejor is translated as a better life. One of the complimentary things we do is build houses for people. Bueno, el programa Vida Mejor surge como una respuesta a las comunidades y a las familias más pobres en la zona rural y en la zona urbana que viven en condiciones infrahumanas o infrasaludables. Entonces, eh, con este proyecto se pretende pues, eh, contribuir a, a ayudar a estas familias y poder eh, sacarlas del subdesarrollo en que actualmente viven. Eh, que tengan una casa digna, un techo digno, un piso digno, un pila y si es posible también un poco mejorado. Remember when Jesus sent the disciples that says, don't take anything with you, don't even take shoes, you know, just go now. So we invite you to come and be part of our ministry. You can be a volunteer, you can come and visit, you can come and work with us with the different talents that you have. You can pray with us, you can help us and encourage us in those times of loneliness. You can also help us to find resources, equipment, medicines, and also we need your financial resources. The need is big. The harvest 
is ready. The workers are few, and we invite you to be a worker with us. What a beautiful invitation, and we invite you as we enter Missions Month together, and I especially want to invite you to pray. Actually, I kind of beg you, <laughs> please pray this month. Pray for the people that you've seen today and that we're going to draw your attention to all month long. Pray for them. Pray for us as a church as we go and as we use our hands and our feet and our dollars to support and to help and to go. I wanted you to know, too, that um, as you pray, our missionaries are praying for us. Just this morning, Brian Hickson put something on the Facebook page, and I thought I'd read it to you just in case you haven't seen it yet, because it's beautiful. <laughs> and I'll try not to cry. But he says, Springs family, as you embark on Missions Month 2016, allow us to thank you for all that you do and all that you've done and are about to do in Jesus' name through those of us trying to be worthy of your blessing and his call. Thank you for the part that you play in being his provision for efforts around the globe. There is much ahead of us in Rwanda as we embark on some major efforts that are only possible through God's grace and favor. 2016 marks 10 years since the Springs family began its partnership with Rwanda. What, a, what God has done in those 10 years is remarkable, and yet only the beginning of great things to come. And Brian says, thank you, and God bless you, and this journey that we share together. I thought his words were the best way to end <laughs> my time with you this morning, but I also want to extend an invitation very quickly. Um, the Rock Board would like to invite you, and um, where's Mike? Mike Osborne? Over there. If you're interested in this event, there's an event coming this Thursday evening, the, the 11th, um, from 5 to 6.30. Um, and Dr. Ben Thomas, the director of, the, of KICS, of the Kigali International Community School, will be here. And so that event is to honor him and also to allow us to hear from him. If you're interested at all and want to know just a little bit more about Rock and about KICS and the school and what's going on in Rwanda, it would be a great way to invest um, an hour and a half of your time. So you're welcome, and please let Mike or myself know if you want to come. And on that invitation, I would also like to invite you to stand and worship as we continue together. Have you guys heard the song, Be Thou My Vision? You haven't heard that, have you? We're going to sing a newer version of it. It's a little quicker, a little more spicy. So here it is. It's called, You Are My Vision.
can't now and always you and you only the first in my heart high king of heaven my to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, His love endures forever, and for the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, forever God is of God we will carry on his love endures forever sing praise sing praise sing it out sing praise we will sing praise
that means. He is forever with us, forever strong. That's when we're moving. That's when we're here. That's all the time. God is with us. Amen.
Good morning, church. I have, uh, or we have, a pretty incredible announcement to, to make this morning in the history of this church. Um, our leadership team met this week with the leadership team over at uh, Northside Christian Church, and they told us that their members would welcome us uh, with uh, joy to come and share their build, building and share their facility. So we were glad to hear that. I, I got to tell you, our meetings with, with this group over there uh, have not only been fun, but they've been very spirit-filled, they've been very humbling, and we feel like God's presence has been there. Um, we think that this is God's path uh, for us as we seek a temporary location uh, for worship while our real estate team uh, continues to search for a more permanent home. So, uh, with that, there is a bittersweet realization. March 6th, March 6th will be our last worship service in this building. Um, let me back up just a minute, though. Because we are planning to shake the roof off this place with a worship service on Saturday night, March the 5th, the night before. Our, uh, our former and our first uh, minister, preacher here, Ronnie White, is going to come back. Uh, Gary Bruce, a longtime worship minister here, is going to be here. And we want to invite every, uh, every springer, every quailer, that worshiped in this building over the years to, to come join us that, in, that evening and remember the wonderful times that we've had. We want to embrace everybody. We want to cry a little bit. We want to celebrate a lot and give God the glory for um, all the baptisms, the births, the weddings, the funerals, the friendships, the marriages, all the life events that this, this old building has witnessed in our lives and in God's name. But the next day, March the 6th, did you catch that? March the 6th. We're going to worship here, and then we are all going to get up, walk out together, get in our vehicles. We're going to travel south down May Avenue together uh, to 122nd Street, make a left turn, to go east a little ways there till we come to the Northside Christian Church facility. We will go into what is their gym area, and we're going to gather in there. And about that time, uh, they will be finishing up their worship service. Their folks are going to come down and join us in the gym. We're going to have a time of communion together with them, and we're going to have some fellowship. Uh, it'll be an opportunity for everybody to, to see the facility. And I... Uh, uh, I think it'll be a great experience. This is going to be an unforgettable weekend, and we pray a, a jubilant and memorial transition to God's next step for this church. If you guys will join me in prayer. God, you are good, and you are faithful, and you are good to us, and you are faithful to us. Despite our fears and our faults and our faithlessness at times, you continue to be faithful to us. Father, we are, sure, are assured of your presence by the glimpses of the incredible work your Spirit is doing on our behalf. When we don't know where to go, you make one path clear for us. We are honored this morning to be able to partake in the body and the blood of Jesus symbolically through the bread and the wine that is prepared here. We are acknowledging that he is the way. He is the truth and the life. And by your grace this morning, we once again recommit our faith and our lives to him, to you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. So I'd invite you now to come down and uh, join together in, in communion. And if anyone would like to pray with any of the leadership here, there will be folks over at the sides as usual.
This is home.
let's all stand and worship. Sing a few more songs together. <laughs>
Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Amen. Good morning, church. Would you go ahead and stand with me and, and recite with me once again Exodus fifteen thirteen? Let's recite this together. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. As you may have noticed uh, from our scripture reading just now, our text this morning stops just short of Exodus 3.13, which is the the famous divine utterance that when when God reveals his name to Moses. But but fear not, uh, because Ben is going to be taking up the mantle of this text from 13. Um, onwards next week. Uh, So we are going to get to that. But this morning, we're focusing in on Exodus 3, 1 through 12, and focusing in on the person of Moses, and specifically this morning, the call of Moses. If you remember the uh, the metaphor that I invoked last Sunday for the Old Testament of a house with, with many different rooms, and we walked into the Exodus room and we saw a portrait on the wall, and last week that was a baby picture. And so this morning, if you'll imagine with me, uh, that, that picture is a senior picture, or at least uh, the picture of a grown man, and it's Moses again. And so if you have seen uh, Charlton Heston's The Ten Commandments, or the animated Prince of Egypt, or God forbid the Christian Bale rendition recently. No, I actually haven't seen it. But if you've seen any of those, then you know that the narrative arc of, you know a little bit about the narrative arc of Moses' life. You kind of know the general outline. But I think this morning it would still be helpful to do a quick little recap. So Moses, uh, last week where we left him, he was just a wee little baby that had traveled down the Nile into the household of Pharaoh's daughter. And and Pharaoh's daughter allowed Moses' Hebrew mother to actually nurse him for a period of time. And so Moses is both, from the beginning, a Hebrew, and yet strangely enough, also an Egyptian. And so the text says in Exodus 2, 11 through 15, one day after Moses had grown up, He went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The the next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. 
But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. And so Moses, who is uniquely Hebrew and also uniquely Egyptian at the same time, sees this confrontation in an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. And so he acts out and he kills the Egyptian. And, and then he flees from Egypt because Pharaoh is trying to kill him. And it's, it's then that Moses settles down in the land of Midian. And Moses finds a, a wife. He marries a woman, the daughter of the priest of Midian. And they actually have a son together and they name him Gershom. Because I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. And then suddenly, when... Perhaps you least expect it. When, when Moses has just settled down into his somewhat comfortable existence, God appears. And, and in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, as we read, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses has taken on this vocation of shepherd, which was a pretty common job description in the ancient Near East. This was a fairly common thing, but for those of us who know where the story of Moses is going... The theological significance is not lost on us. The idea that Moses has become a shepherd, someone who is learning how to lead a flock. But the other thing that this tells us is that Moses has become fully integrated into this Midianite family, into this Midianite community. Because in the ancient Near East, your flock was your capital. That was your wealth and, and your livelihood. So, so Moses has been entrusted with his father-in-law's livelihood, and, and he's taken this flock a significant distance away from the camp. I mean, that would be like my father-in-law giving me access to his pension and sending me to trade on the New York Stock Exchange, which would be good for no one except the New York Stock Exchange, maybe. But, but Moses has become fully integrated. He's got his father-in-law's flock, and it says that he's taken this flock on this particular occasion far away from the camp, which raises the small question of why is he so far away from home? Why has Moses taken this flock so far away? I mean, what possible benefit could a shepherd derive from, from taking his flock all the way through a barren wilderness? I mean, was there no suitable grazing pasture nearby? Or perhaps, perhaps Moses has led this flock to a strange new foreign place because Moses himself is being led imperceptibly by a higher power. And sure enough, Moses comes to a place called Horeb, which is the mountain of God, and, and which will later be referred to as Sinai. And there at the mountain of God, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Um, in preparing for this sermon, I wanted to find some sort of picture or painting or image of this phenomenon of the burning bush for you this morning to, to capture what this scene was like in Exodus 3. And so after scouring several artistic databases, mostly Google, I, I landed on several that I was pretty interested in. And, uh, and this is actually the one that I, I settled on. That's not a projection error. This is a blank slide. Because, you see, as, as much as I love the visual arts, and as much as I'm actually a visual learner by nature, I actually think there's something inherently powerful about the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and the human imagination. And so this morning, rather than letting another artist hijack this scene for us with a pre-digested version of this, I, I want everyone to actually close their eyes this morning. And I want you to let your imaginations fixate upon the words of this text. 
It says, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So God appears. Suddenly, abruptly, splendidly, terribly. You can open your eyes now. God appears to Moses. And he appears to him in flames of fire within a bush that is not consumed, that does not burn up. Now, now stating the totally obvious, we all know that fire burns wood. When fire comes into contact with a bush and ignites, it consumes it. But in this scene, God has suspended the natural properties of fire. God has has held the natural processes at bay here, and this bush is not consumed. And so we could say a lot about the burning bush this morning, this iconic scene. And, And there's actually been some very interesting symbolic interpretations of this scene that have been put forth. But I think at the very least, we can say this, that the God who appears to Moses is the God over creation. And that might not seem like a very profound statement to us this morning. That might not seem very profound to those of us who have heard this story before and seen this scene. But if you imagine it through Moses' eyes, if you imagine that Moses is, is seeing the appearance of the Lord, and he, he realizes that this is the Lord who spoke the world into existence, the Lord who, who formed the cosmos with his speech, This is the God who appears to Moses at Horeb, at the mountain of God. But we quickly find out that this is not simply the God who appears. This is also the God who calls. And he has already called out to Moses from within the bush. He's already said, Moses, Moses. And they began this dialogue. And then, and then God continues to speak in verse 9. He says, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So God has not only appeared and and disrupted Moses' mundane shepherding existence, God has called Moses in this moment. He has threatened to dismantle Moses' life completely by calling him out of it. Because as Ben preached a couple weeks ago, this is the God who hears the cry of his people. This is the God who hears and remembers His covenant. And so God will not stand for this injustice. And He is calling Moses to go back into Egypt to free His people. And what is Moses' response? Who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I mean, I was just in Egypt, God. Uh, and, and remember how things weren't going too well for me there? And, and now things are going well for me. I've got a family and, and a son and a, a wife and a father-in-law who's pretty cool and this flock. And God, things are going pretty good. Heading back to Egypt, not really in the cards for me. Not what I was envisioning. And we do this ourselves, too. You know, we we take a look at our lives and... 
we look out five, ten years, and we kind of make these plans for ourselves. We, we plot these courses. And sometimes we find out God has different plans. Full disclosure, when I started college, part-time, full-time, anytime, I did not think I'd be preaching for a living. And here I am. Now, there was about a year back in middle school when I had finally admitted to myself that I wasn't going to make it to the NBA. And for about a year around that time, I kind of thought, oh, maybe I could be a preacher. But honestly, since then, hasn't been on my radar. But we tend to assume our lives are flowing in a certain direction. We tend to, to assume that we know ourselves best, and therefore we know what's best for ourselves. And, and this sort of audacity, this sort of assumption kind of reminds me of fourth grade geography. This is a map of the continent of Africa, just a simple map of the African continent. And sorry if you can't read all the words there, but as you know, the Nile River starts up in that northern area of the Mediterranean Sea, right near where it says Memphis, and it kind of travels down and it heads down into the White Nile and then down into that Lake Victoria area. And that's where the Nile River is. However, there's something wrong with the way I've just described the Nile River. Because you know that when a fourth grader looks at a map of Africa and sees the Nile River, they think, of course, uh, rivers travel south. Rivers uh, go from top to bottom. They travel downwards. So the Nile starts at the top of the map and it comes all the way down to the bottom, right? But we know that the Nile doesn't flow that way. Rivers don't necessarily flow down the map. They don't necessarily flow south. Rivers flow downhill. They flow downstream. So it doesn't matter which way south is. It matters which way the elevation is going. And so we're working with limited information here. And what we need is this. This is an elevation map of Africa. And so all the areas in red are, are the highest elevation. Those are the high points of Africa. And then the elevation lowers as you get into orange and yellow and down to green. And then finally, the very lowest elevation is blue. And so from this map, we can deduce pretty easily that, that the Nile River starts in these high elevation red areas down to the southeast. And, and then it kind of heads downward, and, and which is actually north on our map, out into the Mediterranean Sea. But when you're a fourth grade geography student looking at a map of Africa, looking at the first map, it's easy to assume that the Nile must just flow downstream, down the map. That's the way rivers run, right? But when we look at the right map with the right information, we see that there's so much more at play. There are intricacies and details and, and factors that we couldn't deduce from the first perspective. And this is the map that we have of our lives. We know the general shape and the outline. And in general, we know we have a pretty good idea of where things are, what we've done, and, and where certain storylines seem to start and stop. And we can sort of navigate ourselves with this map. But this is the map that God has of our lives. God's map is detailed and intricate and divine. God's map is colorful, and, and He sees the color and the contour and every crevice. He sees the elevation, not just where things are, but which direction things are headed. God sees that river that we might think is headed in a certain place, and He knows that it's actually going in the opposite direction. God sees that, that area that we thought was one of our lowest moments or our lower, lowest storylines, and God sees that that's going to be part of the highest calling on our lives. Our map is flat and finite, and God's map is deep and infinite. And Proverbs 16.9 says, In their hearts humans plan their course but the Lord establishes their steps. 
And so we think the rivers of our lives are flowing south. But God has better information. And God has better intentions. And, and Moses certainly thought that the river of his life was going in a certain direction. Moses definitely thinks that the narrative arc of his life is headed out of Egypt, away from that land, away from his, his Hebrew identity, away from his Egyptian identity, and he has now settled down into this somewhat comfortable life in Midian. And this morning being Mission Sunday, I'm reminded of Brett and Kelly Shrek our wonderful missionaries in Kigali, Rwanda, um, who you saw earlier. And, and if you've actually heard Brett tell his story about how he got into the mission field, he talks about how he had kind of just settled down into a fairly comfortable existence here in Oklahoma. He, he had a pretty successful business. He was a successful businessman with a good family and a good job and, and, and a great future and a good church home. And then... God called. And God called him like Moses out of his comfortable station into a new, previously unimaginable vocation. But fortunately for Brett, and fortunately for Moses and for all of us, this is not simply the God who appears and not simply the God who calls, but this is also the God who affirms us. And this God affirms us with His presence. And after Moses protests with the question, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God says to him, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So, so Moses has been looking at his own map, and God sees all, all of the details of, of his own map of Moses. However, his response here doesn't even address that. His response here doesn't even point towards Moses. God's response reveals that it's not about Moses at all. It's simply about God. Because Moses, his question, he says, Who am I, who am I that I should lead the Israelites out. And God takes that, that first personal pronoun that Moses uses and he turns it on him. He says, who am I? I will be with you. Moses, I will be with you and I am the one who have sent you. Because Moses didn't choose God. God chose Moses. And, and Moses was not waiting for God to come along and disrupt his life. God, God did that for him because God will be with Moses. It doesn't matter what Moses' map looks like. It doesn't matter what the elevations are because this is the God who moves mountains. It doesn't matter what Moses' past looks like or what his future looks like. This is the God who is present. And this is the God, the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He's the God of Moses' father. He's the God of today and tomorrow. And, and he says, Moses, it does not matter who you are. It matters who I am. And I will be with you. And, and I can't encounter this text, this appearance, call, and affirmation on a mountain any longer without thinking of another appearance, call, and affirmation that happens on a different mountain. In the, in the last few verses of the book of Matthew, after Jesus has died and risen from the dead, he meets his disciples on a mountain. And on that mountain, they worship Jesus. And then he addresses them like this. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. So the God who appears and calls and affirms Moses at Horeb is the same God who appears calls and affirms us 
through his son, Jesus. And this is not a God that will abandon us to our own devices or abandon us in any way. This is a God who calls us to go and promises to go with us. And so I've got two questions for you this morning. And the first question is, is God calling you to salvation? Maybe, maybe you're like Moses and you've, you've found yourself running from your past so far and so long that you, you wind up in a desert. And you, you find yourself in need of a Savior, in need of a God who will reach down and give you a cool drink of water on a parched hot day. Maybe you're in need of a God who will who'll pull you out of the mire of sin. And, and this is the God who will be with you, who calls you finally into the rest of His ultimate grace. And secondly, is God calling you to a vocation? Or put differently, to what vocation is God calling you? Because He is calling you to something. I've said before that it's not enough to be freed from something. You have to be freed to something. And so God has given each of us unique skills and abilities and and opportunities that we can enact His radical kingdom love. So maybe it's time to to put your money where your mouth is and finally foster a child. or, Or maybe it's time to go visit a foreign mission site and see what God is up to elsewhere in the world. But He is calling you. So, so church, I just ask that you would have eyes to see and ears to hear that call because he will be faithful on whatever mission it is that he sends you. Ignatius of Loyola said, act as if everything depended on you. Trust as if everything depended on God. So church, let's stand and open our hearts to the voice of his Holy Spirit this morning. Pray. Right. 
church for our benediction this morning I'd like to pray uh, this prayer with you would you say this with me God you are the power of liberation calling your servant Moses to lead your people into freedom and giving him the wisdom to proclaim your holy law be our Passover from the land of injustice be the light that leads us to the perfect rule of love, that we may be citizens of your unfettered reign. We ask this through Jesus Christ, the pioneer of our salvation. Amen. Go in peace, church. can't do. Yes, we know there are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome.